Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Yoxus's Stories on Steel. This is a steel industry podcast featuring the big names of the business and the advice slash stories they've accrued over their years as insiders. Steel has been a vital component in American life for well over a century, and the men and women who've helped it flourish are a diverse group of innovators full of interesting tales. We hope to share some of said tales here with you today. Thanks again to Eoxys for providing this platform. In addition to this show, they are bringing businesses online by providing a standardized digital workspace for all your steel-related needs. Today, we are proud to welcome the owner of Looter Steel Corp and hobbyist YouTuber, Lewis Denon. Lewis, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing? It is my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I'm doing quite well, sir. I know we, we, were, uh, we were having a pre-podcast podcast just a few moments ago to getting into <laughs> all sorts of fun topics. But, you know, we're, we're here to, for, to gain some insight onto your perspective in the industry, and we, we can't sure. wait to learn more about that. So if you could, sure. uh, just for our listeners and viewers, give us a brief insight on how you found your way into the steel business. Sure. So, um, so when I grew up, my father... Um, was one of the owners of a company called Denon Steel. And so that was the family business. And so, you know, as early as, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 years old, um, my, my sister, myself, and, and my cousin uh, Peter actually would, uh, would always go down to uh, the office on Saturdays, almost always on Sundays. And so that was our first, that was at least my first, um, I don't know, experience within the business. So I would walk in the shop, my dad would talk me, would take me out into the shop. We'd, we'd talk about steel and we'd look at the cranes and we'd look at the, you know, we'd just look at the business. And so I was sort of um, exposed really, really early. And then in high school, um, I, I, I used to go down to the office and I would file and I would type stuff. He, you know, he would ask me to help. And then in, uh, in college during the summers uh, is kind of where I learned how to sell. So I, I would go in there every summer and I would start at I don't know, 7.30, 8 o'clock, whenever I got there. And he would teach me how to cold call, which I have to tell you is not easy. And that's what I would learn to do. And I did that almost, I guess, three or four summers in a row. And I would, I would spend a lot of the summer learning how to cold call and the rest of the summer trying to sell. And I guess that's how I sort of got into the business. Now, and this is a, this is, I'm going to have to take the wrap here a little bit, just because I know how in the past I've, been bad about responding to cold callers. I have not been as nice as I should have been because they're just trying to do a job and, you know, same as me. Yep. Did you get, did you get any kind of uh, harsh reactions when you were on the phones or? <laughs> you, you know, something I, I got all reactions you can imagine. And, and I tell you, when my dad would sit and explain to me how to do it, there were certain things you can't really prepare somebody for. And that is the reactions you're going to get from some people. And some people would just flat out hang up the phone on you. Other people would say, Oh, I'm not interested. And the conversation went in very abruptly. And you, you had to let those kind of roll off as my dad would say, roll, roll off your sleeve. And it wasn't easy because you would literally be, be calling, you know, a hundred, 150 calls every day. And you had to take notes and you had to, oh, that one didn't answer. And you checked that off or that one hung up by being checked that one off. And you, you just hope that you could get somebody that would at least listen for a couple of seconds for you to say, oh, is it okay to talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> and those people were gold because at least you could then talk. I, I have to it imagine, hard, yeah. I have to imagine there has to be moments where you, you, you do end up getting somebody on the phone and you just go, oh no, what do I do now? <laughs> the, the, the first several probably weeks um, when I first began. Yeah, but I, I I guess I was always considered to be a natural sort of conversationalist. Some of us just talk. And so as long as I got somebody on the phone who would talk to me, um, that's kind of where I learned that it didn't always have to be about the specific business, the item, the the, the product, the machine. It could just be trying to get to know the other person. And when I sort of let my natural ability sort of take over. I kind of stopped a little bit of my selling and I just got to know somebody, but it was, it, it was so hard to get uh, past that initial, is it okay to talk to you about stealing? You know, it, it involves the sales. It involves the, the script. Hi, my name is Lou Denon. I'm calling from Denon Steel. We have this building, we have this equipment, blah, 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 blah. And there's a script. And when it's all done, 
can I please ask you some more questions? And that's where like the pause is coming. Will they say yes or no? And it's, and I tell you any salesman, probably in any business, but certainly in the steel business, this is, it's kind of, I don't want to say a rite of passage, but we all have to learn how to do it because that's how you find your customers. I, I would, it sounds like you learned a lot about building rapport in a very short amount of time. You know, you have only seconds worth of people's attention on, especially from a cold call standpoint. Yep. Um, did you take any big lessons from, from that phase of your steel journey that you've, you've carried today? Or was it more just, this is a, an annoying thing that every one of us has to do? <laughs> no, no, I, I definitely have taken that because I, I, I've taken that into almost every interpersonal relationship or interaction that I've ever had, whether it was on the phone, whether it was, you know, now on social media in, in a text or a messenger form, whether it's an email, whether it's, you know, sitting in an airport or whatever, any, any connection that I've ever made with anybody where you have to sort of break the ice. Um, you have to kind of determine, okay, you have to learn how to read the other person. And I think that's a real, that's a skill that can be learned for those of us that talk a lot, maybe it's a, it doesn't have to be learned quite as much, but you have to learn how to read the, the other person and, and figure out what you can and can't say. So I learned a lot of that cold calling and it's, it's helped me in my business. It's helped me in my, my life. It's helped me with my kids. <laughs> you know, those are, those are skills that are, and, and yeah, everybody has a bad day. You, know, you can get a person whose dog died that morning, or you get a person who's had, had a fight with their kid. I've had, you know, whatever. And, and they're just in a bad mood. And except that's like the big call you were supposed to make. You know, and those are things that I, I, I think every salesperson probably needs to know how to do. Um, but it, it can be learned. So I, one, as someone who's worked retail on the Jersey Shore, I definitely agree that you, you learn to <laughs> be one, be patient and two, just look for those little bits of, you know, opportunity and, and goodness in your fellow man, even when it, it seems not there, especially when you're dealing Agreed. with a lot of Philadelphia Eagles fans, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> I, so you, you, you were working the calls. What's the, what's the next step for you after that? Sure. So I think, I guess in that process, once I connected with somebody who said, you know, yes, um, you, you can talk to me. Then the question was, okay, wh what is it that you do? You know, what do you guys do? You're a, you're a sheet metal manufacturer. What, can you tell me more about what you do? And then you hope to engage the person on the phone in, tell me what you, what, what you make. Well, I make shelving, I make HVAC, I make parts for Ford, whatever it is. And that for, is, it was the first time that I began to learn what other people did. And as a salesperson, even as an owner of a company, that to me was the insight in I needed. What is it that you do? Because what is it that I can now help you do or help you do faster or better? Because if I'm just going to offer you, here's some steel, you know, that's great. I can be like, well, I need to find out what is it that you do? What is it that helps make your day easier? What is it, what, what challenge do you have? But it all started with, asking the person, what is it that your business does? And then pay attention to what they're telling you and write notes down if you have to. And that was the next step. And then if it got to that point, then I could say to them, hey, that's great. Um, what kind of steel do you use to make those parts? And that to me is when I, and again, early on when I began learning how to do this, it was really hard. Now that I've done it enough times, I kind of you know have a bit of an idea of, okay, well, they use coral, they use galvanized, they use painted, I can ask more questions. But the next step was to try to find out then what do they use, write those notes down. And if you got lucky, you could ask, do you mind if I quote you on a job or may I offer you steel? And uh, maybe you, you make a connection then. To deviate just a little bit, I know that sure. you know, as someone who has come into the, the, the media side of things, learning about the different types of steel and the, the different purposes thereof, it, it was a lot of info coming in. Were you with uh, this being a family business, were you raised with a lot of these terms or did you have to learn a lot uh, once you started working for the company? You, you know something, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I probably heard a lot of the terms. I don't necessarily know if I would have known what they meant. So when I began talking to customers that weren't people that worked at the company, they began making more sense because I began hearing slitter or blanker or forklift or, or, you know, skids or whatever, whatever the phrase, you know, uh, you know, trim coming off of the, the coil scrap. 
now I began talking to customers enough and I began to understand what those terms meant because I began hearing them enough. What was kind of cool was um, growing up, like I said, my, my dad and I could always talk about two things. We could always talk about Michigan State sports and we could talk about the steel business. And that was something that I, my dad has since passed and that is something that I definitely miss, but we could always talk steel. And we did at length. And a lot of that, I think, I helped early on, but it also from, from doing those cold calls and talking to customers, it made the time with my father and the information interaction that much better because now I could speak at least the same language. So it definitely helped. Oh, well, that's really, it, it's really good to hear that that kind of, just because of what the one of the, one of the biggest things I've learned in running the show is that Steel is one of those last truly family, not just business, like businesses, you get a lot of these family hierarchy businesses that get passed on. It's almost like a family uh, position, if, if that makes any <laughs> sense. It's a, fa it's a family industry. It's a family industry. That's the word I'm looking for, where there's a lot of people that if, the fa if those connections aren't there immediately, they're formed just because of how tactile the, the subject matter at hand is. You know, do, do, do yes. you find that? No, I, I, like, I can definitely tell you that the, the people that I have worked with in the business, a lot of them that I started in the business with back in, I guess the late eighties, early nineties, many of them are still in the business. And most of us, a lot of us know each other. We all know the same names and, and there's a lot of, I believe a, a lot of respect amongst a lot of us. We, we know each other. We know what we, a lot of what we've, what we've all been through. When, when somebody has a, you know, a, a challenge, many of us have felt that challenge. When somebody has a success, a lot of times we, 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 we're happy for them, believe it or not, because we know that could be us the next time. Um, when we you know, read stories of, of a company that, that went bankrupt, something bad happened. And I think it, 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 it feels real to all of us, especially those of us who are in it, because we know that person, we know the people in the company, we know them. And it, it makes it much less just a business thing that happened. It makes it a very real thing that happened because, you know, this is how a lot of us make our living. And, you know, those, <clears throat> excuse me, those, those successes and, and unfortunately, those, sometimes those, those things that don't go so well hit home. And I think a lot of us can relate, I think. Did those feelings change, uh, to, not to jump around too much, but did those sure. feelings change at all once you made the, the transition from, you know, part of the business to one of the owners of a business to more of a leadership position? So, it, you know, so it's interesting. When, so my journey at, 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 at the family business was, was different than probably a lot of people's journeys at a family owned business. Um, so I started with, uh, in say, I guess I started selling, but my first real job from the summer was coming in as an administrative assistant. And it was a really, that's a lot harder of a job than it sounds because there were a lot of things I was responsible for, but I learned, I learned a lot. And I then transitioned into sales and I did that. And oddly enough, I actually, I actually left my, my dad's business and I went to work for a couple of other um, companies for, for a couple of years. When I came back, I, I, I was brought back in as a manager of one of the sales divisions. And it was a whole different thing because although, you know, I understood the buy and the sell, I got the, the machinations of the business. I don't think I quite understood exactly how to manage or how to handle people, at, at least at that level. And I learned, you know, I, I had to learn that. I suddenly realized that as a manager, I had to be not just in charge of the inventory, making sure it all got sold. But you're suddenly a a a you know a priest and a rabbi and a and a and a psychiatrist and a you're a bunch of things, and a lot of people that take on a management position I don't know if they really understand that there's a lot and you have to have empathy for people, and I think um I think there's a reason as you, as you get older, it's easier to manage people maybe that are younger than you I'm not sure it's 100 percent accurate but I think that you need to have gone through some of the stuff they've gone through to have that empathy and understand it. And I think it made it easier that I knew the business, but I almost wished I'd been a little bit older when I finally became a manager because I might've had a little more life, you know, hit you in the head experience, but you know, it's a progression. And then eventually I went on to start my own company. I, I think that there's, there's definitely value in that argument. You know, I think a lot of people look at anything that they start in life and say, man, if only I had started it when I was a kid, you know, point of reference, I, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu in my free time. And, um, wow. I, 
I got into it when I was 19 and I, the whole time, like the first year I was like, man, I stink at this. There's these kids that are way better than me. I wish I had done it when I was younger. But when I started to really think about it, I remembered that I was, I was a poor loser when I was a kid. Like it, I probably wasn't mentally ready for what all this stuff meant. So, you know, I hit it right. when I was supposed to hit it, you know, and I think that a lot of people find that. And I think that the steel industry is full of those people that rise up when they realize that you're hitting the things when you need to be hitting them. I, I no, I definitely agree with that. I think, um, I, I think I, as I look back on all the jobs I ever did, being the manager was the hardest and the most fun job I ever had because I was, there was always activity going on. I was always in every conversation. I had to always keep my sort of um, attention on everything on multiple things, but I loved it. And I loved the stress and I loved having to deal with, again, the inventory and what was coming in, what was going out and each person's situation and how my salesmen were doing and how the administrative people were doing and, and even the meetings I was in. I was ready for it. I loved it. Like I said, I wish I might've been just a little bit older and had a little more life experience, but you know, in a family business, sometimes the owners want to move up, you know, their family members faster. I get it. I, I especially now being a little older, I, I understand what was happening now, but I learned a hell of a lot and I enjoyed it. I, well, again, that's really, that's really great to hear. So uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you were working for the family business manager, at, now you're at, uh, now you're the owner of a uh, Luter Steel Corp. Right. How did that leap happen? <laughs> so I guess the, the easiest way to say that is many of us in family owned businesses, sometimes they don't always go the way you want them to go. And I think maybe that, maybe that's, maybe that maybe the safest way to say that sometimes things don't always work. And I think anybody that's listening to this, that is, uh, involved in a family owned business probably can relate to what I'm saying. I'm going to go um, ahead and, and I'm going to expand that a little bit. If anyone has had a contentious Thanksgiving uh, dinner with extended family members, you get what he's, <laughs> what he's talking about. You can, yes. That's a very fair point. And then if you, and then if you add that up to, to a family owned business, it can get very, very contentious. Unfortunately, I, um, I eventually, frankly, with my dad's help, um, ended up leaving and starting my own company in 1999. And I became what I would call a trader, what other people in the industry would call a broker. And, and then of course, when we were in the business, brokers were those evil, terrible people that didn't own their own equipment. And then I suddenly became one of them. And I realized that we weren't quite as evil and terrible as you know, I, I had assumed. You know, most of us who don't own our, our equipment um, have an idea of what we're doing. It's exhausting. We have just as much stress as anybody else who owns any other business because most of us take possession legally of the, of the product and we're responsible for selling it and getting paid. It's just that all of a sudden, all of the responsibility is on you. And I, I learned that quick in 99 when I started, but I gotta be honest, for the first couple, three, four months, I don't think, I, I didn't um, make a lot of sales. And I think it was purely out of fear. I think the fear was I didn't have confidence in my ability to run the business. And the weird thing is what I was doing was the same thing I was doing as a manager. I was buying and selling. Once it clicked, once I figured it out, which is around, I guess, April after I started, it became easy is the wrong word. It became um, um, fluid. It started to happen. I began to buy and sell and make connections and, and get back on the phone. And all of a sudden, it just began to run. And then it became fun. And then I understood what I was doing. And then that's, and that's kind of, and, and so essentially what I was doing in the business was this very same thing I was doing when I managed my uh, the sales division at Denon. I was still buying and selling all over the country, moving tons around, finding end users, doing the same thing anybody would do in a steel company, except I was doing it on my own. Uh, did, the, did the sense of reward feel different since you were now a solo operator away from the family business? So the sense of reward, that's, it's, it's odd. The first couple, three times I made sales and I realized that money that I made was mine. Like it wasn't like a salary. I actually made money. But then the first time I had a problem and I did early because it always happens when you're in the business, I realized that problem was mine. I couldn't just push it off and, well, the company will handle it. I'm the company. So, it, it, you know, so if, if, if there's a real problem and you have steel and a guy calls you and he says, okay, your steel's on the line and it's, and it's got rust all over it or whatever, or, you know, the, the gauge changed or there's a hole in the steel. And all of a sudden you realize that's your money sitting on the equipment. <laughs> that's capital. <laughs> that, 
that's capital, absolutely. And so all of that changes when you shift, I think, to becoming an owner because you feel it differently. And, and sometimes even your decision-making becomes different so that when you're, when I became my own uh, owner of my own business and so, you know, the mill would say, okay, Lou, here's 400 tons. Would you like to buy it? Before when I was at Den and I would have said, yeah, we'll just, you know, throw it in the mix. Now that I'm the owner of the business and I go, okay, that's, let's see, that's 800,000 pounds and it's going to cost me X and that's X amount off the line of credit. And do I know where I'm going to sell it? Do I want? All those machinations have to go on very, very, very quickly. And you have to decide if you want it or if you don't versus when I was sort of just the manager, yeah, throw it in the mix. When you're the owner, you have to really think about that. That That's something that I learned quickly. Yeah, you can't, there's no write-offs, no write-offs for the man in charge, you know? <laughs> no, I, I want you. I got it. Well, I think that dovetails beautifully into the next thing I want to talk about, which is, uh, you know, there's been some, a, a series of unprecedented events happened uh, in last year and into this year. No, most notably yeah. the coronavirus pandemic shut down uh, everything for everybody in almost every way you can yeah, imagine. Yeah. So as a, a bit, by this point, you've been in the, uh, in your own business for a long time, but still did, did you find yourself having to react to n different problems and, and way different circumstances than you ever thought you would have to? You know, it's, it's actually interesting. I would compare this to 2008. Oh, the financial and crash. Some of the yeah. people that I've spoken, yeah, and a lot of the people that I've spoken to, particularly thus that that particularly those of us I think that are owners, um, can relate as well. And that is, we all watched sort of early 08 as the market began to move up, just you know at a crazy pace until right on into the summer, you know July where the market was flying, scrap was flying, and it looked like it literally was never gonna end. And then all of a sudden, if I remember right, July turned to August and it's like somebody had turned a light switch off. And all of a sudden, anybody, all of us were scrambling very quickly trying to figure out how do you navigate through this. But it was this crazy run up. Well, during this pandemic, similar things have happened, not the same. When it began, I think most of us began questioning, okay, wait a minute, Will the processors keep process? Will the trucks keep moving metal? It, it, it wasn't as, and, and even are our customers even working? Are their guys working on the lines? What's happening? And it was very fluid, very quickly. And then as things began to settle through the, from what I felt through sort of the, the summer months, it's as if the market dropped. You could suddenly see people offering tons left and right. Prices were dropping, but something odd happened. It came back the other way based on a lack of supply and went flying. And you're now seeing pricing that is, I would say, more than double what it had been three or four or five months ago. And the challenge, look, when you're an owner of a business and you've got a line of credit and you've got all those things at, at work, you have to suddenly really make you know, quick, quick decisions. Obviously, you know, and if you're a, if you're a business manager and you're, you're responsible for, for the same thing at, at a bigger company, I get it too and I respect it. You've got a lot of stuff on your head very quickly. And part of it is guessing, just like in 2008, guessing. Do we keep inventory? Do we dump it? Do we think the market, because there's no, uh, there's no consistency in the market right now. And we know it's all supply driven, but when will, the, when will the other shoe drop? And so the risk, I think, to any company, any business owner uh, right now, it's particularly in the steel business, is do you keep buying galvanized at 65 cents? Do you keep buying hot band at 50, whatever? Do you keep buying it? What happens if it shifts the other way? And what happens if your customers suddenly begin, what if COVID comes back and your customers suddenly have problems and all that stops? The bank will come knocking and want to know where their money is. So there's, those are, like I said, so I would compare it to 08 in the sense that pricing moves up, your cost increase yet you don't necessarily know what's going to happen exactly tomorrow. So you've got to make very quick decisions, sometimes based on your gut and sometimes based on good old fashioned mathematics. And sometimes you have to just sit there and say, okay, I am not going above or beyond these numbers and stay with it. And sometimes, you're, sometimes you, have, you, you use, a, use your gut to make a decision, but it, all of that is, I've seen that movie and it happened in 08, similar, not the same, but I think it's helped. It helped me anyway. I would love to ask, it's, that's a very measured and experienced response to what is a very chaotic situation. And I'd love to 
to get your opinion on something. Assuming sure. you like, let's, let's shift up the timeline a little bit. Assume that you had started out on your own, your own business. You're still a young, like a younger man a year before the coronavirus pandemic happens. And so you're still very much a new business owner during this crisis. Do you think, what kind of decisions do you think you would have made differently in response to everything? Well, I wouldn't have, I, so I wouldn't have had 2008 or even I'll go back a couple of years, 2004 with market dramatically increased. I wouldn't have had those to be able to guide me. And yeah. so I'm not, I, I don't know what I, I might've made different decisions as it related to inventory. Um, I might've made, I might, I might've loaded up on inventory and I shouldn't have, or I might've dumped inventory too fast. And I, and, and I, and I didn't, hadn't need to, because I, I would have had experience to say, well, wait, we've seen this, we know what could happen. Um, I might have, I, I think those are the best, those are the two best answers. I don't know if I would have had that experience to have known to trust my instincts as much and, and trust that because I had gone through it, I could get through it again. I'm not sure if that makes, I hope that sounds clear. No, I, I, I think lived experiences need to be taken into account, especially when you have so little to compare, unless we have people that were alive during the Spanish flu, who could, uh, I think 2008 is the best uh, 2008 right after nine 11, maybe are the best things we have to compare this to in terms of just chaos and wondering what's going to happen. Is our country going to be okay? Um, ha- has, has the way that the industry has responded as a whole to coronavirus surprised you at all? Has it surprised me? You know, I, I got to be honest, no. I, I, no in that I know that a lot of the companies want and need to get their folks back to work. And they did that as quickly as they could. Knowing that they had to find ways to make it safe for their people to come back, whether it was on the shop floor, whether it was in the office, and they recognized that they did have their own clients and needed to have product too. And now, it, whether those... Again, whether those were all in, you know, uh, uh, the frontline industries, I, I'm sure plenty of them were in medical. Okay, so I recognize that that was all very important to companies to get people moving. And you know, God bless people like the, the drivers who just kept on driving. And you know, and and, and to, to be fair, you could you could apply that to almost you know any industry out there right now where people kept working. God bless them. But in the, I was really impressed with the fact that the manufacturing world seemed to keep on manufacturing. And I think, again, I think what got crazy is when they realized they were running out of product and couldn't get it as quickly. And that's part of what's led us here now. Um, but I was really, really, really proud to see how fast our industry um, responded and kept working. That was very cool. I think it also helped that so many online tools like Zoom and and different mediums were already in development and th- this has only accelerated their use you know zoom's never been more stable than right now um do you think that the push towards more online presences is uh needed in the steel industry like more of a focus on that avenue of communication just because i know you know still you, you still get faxes you know so <laughs> <laughs> how, right, how so necessary I'll, I'll, is it <laughs> i'll give you i'll give you I'm sorry. That's, that's my dog. Oh, no problem. Everybody's got a dog. Nava. Really? She probably saw a squirrel. I'm sorry. I got to, don't worry about it. (laughs) So let me, let me try to answer that question in in a very quick timeline. If I can, when I first started, we would take um, three by five cards. We take three by five cards look like this. And we put an, we put an address and a sticker and we put a hundred tons of this, 200 tons of this, hundred tons, and we mail it. And then we'd call them three days later. That's how we would offer people steel. Then the fax machine showed up and all of us had to quickly figure out how to learn to use the fax. And we figured out that we could send out 150 faxes to customers quickly. Then email showed up. In other words, we kept finding ways to communicate. But online, the the marketplace, and I know that it's definitely shifted and there are new ways to communicate with customers online. I hate to say that I'm still from the old school, but I still believe the best way to communicate with your customers is get them on the phone. Now, maybe Zoom as well, and, and I appreciate that, but I almost feel like, and I've talked to other, other companies, other friends of mine out there, they felt like that too. With the advent of email and the advent of texting each other, we've lost the 
not the art of talking, but the ability to communicate and listen to what the other person is saying. Now, certainly with, with COVID, we can't visit each other as much, which is really a bummer. And I think Zoom probably helps. As long as the client wants to get on Zoom with you, then I think it's good. But I think that talking to people, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's you know on the phone, is so huge. It's such, a, it's such a huge way of communicating, getting to know the other person and having that relationship versus just lines on a, on a screen and you're not really sure what the intention is, you know, smiley face, frowny face. <laughs> um, I think Zoom can help. And I think it's helping. So like you and I are talking and we're communicating and we're seeing each other and we're seeing, okay, that's helping. And it, and it very well may become, you know, uh, the wave of, of the future. On, on the flip side, product still has to be chopped up and it still has to be moved and that still has to be done physically in a plant. So there's that level too. Um, but listen, I like Zoom. I like the way that you communicate on it. There's other mediums that you can use too. I like it a lot. I like it better than texting each other and sending emails. I'd rather talk to people like this. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, without this, I wouldn't have a job. So <laughs> uh, maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, all right. Okay. Uh, Lewis, I, I hate to be that guy, but we are running up on time a little bit here. We, we like to keep these things as close to 30 minutes as possible. So, but if you have any closing remarks, uh, any sort of like last thoughts you'd love to leave our listeners with, uh, feel free. The floor is yours. Sure. So I listen, it, I've been in the steel business one way or the other since probably, you know, 85. And it, it's shocking to think that that many years later, I'm still, you know, in the business. There are so many good people in this business who I have met from administrators to secretaries to owners and CEOs and, and people in the shop and the shop and drivers who work there, who work hard, who are honest, who care about what they're doing, who care about their clients. I have been very fortunate to have met a lot of them. And I, I agree with um, a lot of what I've been hearing lately, which is, People seem to have lost the 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 desire to want to you know work in a plant or work in a business like ours. They're they're all kind of seduced by this online stuff, which is great. This is a good business. It's a good way to make a living. There are good people in it. It's interesting. It's fun. It uses your creativity and your brain and your thoughts, and you have to communicate. And there's a lot of different things you can do in the business. And I I I would encourage anybody that's you know in their late teens, early twenties, mid twenties. This is a good business with good people and it's going to keep getting better in my opinion so all right well Lewis, that that is, i i think that is a, a phenomenal uh place to end things until of course we have to have you back because you know you still owe me a, you still owe me a hollow bread recipe if i remember correctly <laughs> i'll take uh, care of that for you no problem uh, i appreciate it just for you oh man just uh uh, now I'm hungry. That's going to be bugging me all day. <laughs> but, all right. Well, this is, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, this has been another insightful episode of Yoxus's Stories on Steel. Thanks again to Lewis for dropping by. And remember, whether galvanized or hot rolled, Yoxus will provide a marketplace to take any steel business to the online sector. Thank you and good night.